Hello everybody, this is Yiji and welcome back to Project Espa. In this series of videos, I walk you through my process of world building my world Espa, with today's focus being on planning out the planetary system around my primary star Ojor. So get comfy and let's dive in. Last episode, I built my star system, consisting of three stars, Ojor, a solar analog being the primary star, which is orbited at great distance by a close pair of red dwarfs, far enough away to leave enough room for a classical planetary system around Ojor, and maybe even give a planet or two to the red dwarfs themselves. For this video though, the focus will be on Ojor's planets. The oldest versions of Ojer's planetary system consist of seven planets, one of which being a binary planet. In the 2013 version, it has five rocky planets and three gas giants, two of which being in a binary system, which by 2014 had become three rocky planets and four gas giants, again two of which are in a binary system. Subsequent versions then added two additional ice giants, bringing us back to the most recent 2020 model of the Ojoran system, which has three rocky planets in its inner solar system and six gas giants in its outer solar system. This most recent version is of course what's going to serve as my template again. We'll fix it, tweak it, but ultimately keep the same model. I've been working with this system for about 11 years now, so I'm pretty happy with where it's at model-wise. My goal for the Ojoran system is to go really classical. We live in an age of exoplanets and quite a number of bizarre planetary systems are known now, but this is actually an area where I want to keep things mostly simple and base it off our own solar system rather than a crazy Trappist thing or whatever. Now, while it can for sure be debated about how common or uncommon the configuration of the planets in our solar system is or isn't, while we know of many planets, our methods of finding them tend to favor planets unlike those in our solar system. This debate is perhaps best left for a follow-up video to this one, as regardless of whether the solar system's model can be expected to be common or rare, it's what I want to base the Ojoran system upon, because the solar system is by far the most well-studied planetary system out there, which makes it the most well understood, even if not fully. This is helpful for world building, because you can't very well build upon a model you don't fully understand, even if you know it can exist. Knowing what we are working with is going to be incredibly helpful. I cannot stress this enough. Regardless of if the solar system can be expected a typical or atypical outcome of planetary formation, because we most well understand it, this is the best option to use for a high detail world like ESPA, and what that means to me is having an inner solar system with rocky planets, which is separated from an outer solar system with gaseous planets by an asteroid belt, and then has a Kuiper belt marking its edge. Again, this is definitely staying on the safe side here, but don't worry, this is hardly a restrictive model by any means, and we will still have plenty of ways to add spies into this system without having to resort to crazy core shenanigans. Okay, so with all that established, let's hammer out a planetary system, which will mostly just be establishing the orbits. But before we can get to those, we will need to establish two even more important lines, the habitable zone and the frost line. Both of these are crucial for the way we will be establishing our orbits. The habitable zone determines where planets are the right distance from Ojor to sustain liquid water, an essential ingredient for a planet's ability to create and sustain life. The frost line is the minimum distance at which the volatile components such as water, methane and ammonia can condense into solid grains. This affects planetary formation majorly. ESPA of course will need liquid water on its surface, and it's an Earth-like planet after all. So it will need to be inside the habitable zone. Gas giants, while they can exist within the frost line, cannot form there. So to scale our model these two are essential. 
We can calculate the inner edge of our habitable zone by dividing Ogre's luminosity by 1.1 and then taking its square root. For the outer edge we do the same but divide by 0.53. And then, for the system's frost line, we multiply the luminosity's root by 4.85. Again, I'm running through the math kinda quickly here. The frost line is not very exact, because we are dealing with multiple volatiles. There are actually several different frost lines. This one here is specifically for water. The frost lines for methane, ammonia and carbon dioxide are typically understood to be further out than that of water. Hence, it's a smart place to place our largest and closest gas giant a bit further beyond this line. Within a solar system based model, the most important component is Jupiter. He is the most massive of the planets, thus through complex mechanics all other orbits are shepherded by him. Jupiter's role in the solar system is truly crucial. Current models support it being the first of the planets that formed, probably before the sun even ignited her fusion, quickly becoming large enough to gather a thick gaseous envelope beyond the frost line. Sticking with our goal for a solar-like system, a similar process will occur around Ojor. While Ojor would still be a protostar gathering mass, a planetary body begins to form slightly beyond the frost line, let's say around 4.5 astronomical units from the young star. When the body reaches about 20 Earth masses, it will start accreting a gaseous envelope. When this envelope becomes more massive than the solid core, a runaway accretion effect will occur, causing the planet's mass to increase rapidly. This is how we are forming a Jovian planet. Let's call ours Manta. And around the same time it starts rapidly growing in mass, we can expect seeing the less massive gas giants to form, alongside hundreds of other planetesimals. In our solar system it is believed that Uranus and Neptune formed much closer to the Sun and migrated outwards later to settle in their modern orbits. The reasons as to why remain not fully understood, but I did a video about this a few years back, so you can definitely go check that one out after this. For simplicity's sake though, we will say the same happens around Ojor, with these planets forming much closer to Ojor before migrating out later onto more distant orbits. Again though, I would like to stress this progress is by no means typical or even a confirmed theory. That said, it is consensus and its effects are well observed, hence I'm choosing to replicate it here in the early Ojoran system. The size of our protoplanetary disk matters a lot here. Modern orbits tend to be logarithmically spaced, so that the ratio between adjacent orbits falls between 1.4 and 2. This rule is roughly known as Titius Bode's law. We say law, but it only upholds very roughly. While there is a rough geometric progression between orbits, it's not absolute. So starting at our gas giant, we simply multiply the semi-major axis of its orbit by a random number between 1.4 and 2, which will give us the semi-major axis of the next orbit. We then repeat this until the outer edge of our system is reached which we are just going to place at the same approximate distance to the inner Kuiper belt in our solar system, being 35 astronomical units away. And there we have the orbits for Ojoran's outer planets. And I'm leaving one of these orbits blank because as I said before, these planets are supposed to have migrated outwards rather than formed there. In theory, we could just fit another planet in here, but I'm choosing not to do this, giving us four outer orbits instead. For the inner Ojoran system, it's going to be much the same, except we divide by the same ratios instead of multiply. S by itself, of course, will have to go in the habitable zone. So let's place it first and then place two orbits further in and voila, here we have an orbital model. The red lines indicate where I quote unquote violated Titius Bode's law and skipped one or even more orbits. While these patterns are observed, they are not strict rules, instead serving more as guidelines. According to Kepler's first law, any orbit is an ellipse and not a perfect circle. How elliptical an orbit is, is expressed using eccentricity. I glanced over this last video a bit when building the stars, but I feel like I should explain it a bit more properly. So eccentricity is the value that determines by how much an orbit deviates from a perfect circle. If its value is zero, it would be a perfect circle. But if its value is between one and zero, it's an ellipse. And if it's above one, it's hyperbolic. 
For most planetary objects, you would expect eccentricities on the lower end. In our solar system, with the exception of Mercury, they are all really low values. Why Mercury is weird here, I don't really know. But just to be safe, let's replicate the same here in the Ochoran system, giving our innermost planet a relatively high eccentricity and the rest a fairly low one. Similarly, we need to assign an orbital inclination, which is simply by how many degrees an orbit is tilted with perspective to the star's axis of rotation. So, 0 degrees means no inclination, 45 degrees will put it like this, 90 degrees means it's vertical, and by 180 degrees the orbit is retrograde. For planets we can expect low values here. Within the solar system the Earth actually has the highest, so let's take values between 1 and 5 degrees here, with our Jovian having the lowest and Espa having the highest. Again, sticking to what I can observe in the solar system here, because I don't fully understand why these values are the way they are in the solar system. And in general, it's not a good idea to tweak something you don't fully understand in world building. If someone knows why these values are this way, please let me know in the comments and we can revisit it in a follow up video. Putting all these values into a table we get this, a fully fledged orbital template for the Ojoran system. There is some weird thing at the bottom, we'll get into that in due time, but for now I'm very happy with this, as it will provide the basis for our planetary system. In the following videos I will do one for each planet, working out the other details, as there is a lot more to cover of course, before we can get to Espa itself. I could rush this, I suppose, but I don't feel like doing that. I want to spend proper time detailing each of these planets, not just the one that will have life. So that then brings us to the comments, and for today's episode we have one by Good Boy. Peak is alive and well. Yeah, so my first ESPA content on this channel dates back 7 years now? Almost 8? Gosh, I feel old saying that, but it's really touching to me that there are people who have been following the channel for this long, throughout all the ups and downs. And it's always such a big relief to me when I get comments like these, because back then, when I posted those first ESPA videos, I was really nervous, right? It's a really big step to go from unvoiced slideshows to voiced edited videos, and I was always worried that people, you know, wouldn't like it or something and just would want more comparisons instead. So it really warms my heart that you considered ESPA content the peak of my channel, because so did I. And there was so much more I wanted to do with it back then that I never really got to do. Well my friend, we're gonna get to all of that now. So make sure you're subscribed if you want to see how deep this world building rabbit hole goes, and I'll take you all along on this journey. Tell me below if you are excited for that, and as always thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys in the next one, where we are going to work out our first planet, a Kundor. Stay tuned.